Hello, welcome to our next week here as we're reading through the Bible in a year and we're on to week three, our readings, we're going to finish up the book of Genesis this week, uh, was it Genesis 36 through 50, yep. and then um, we'll dive a little bit into the book of Acts on your own this week, we won't cover that here um, in our video because we want to cover that all in one unit, but you'll get through that and then what's Matthew's gospel? Matthew this week is Matthew 9 through 12. 9 through 12 and then what psalms are we covering? Psalms 7 through 9. Okay, so 7 through 9. Those will be the next three psalms we dig into. So today we're here, we're going to finish up what we've been talking about the last two weeks with um, the book of Genesis and the readings that we've covered from there. Um, you just got back from vacation. How was that? It was very nice. Very good. It's good to be back too, but it was good to be gone. Got some rest in. Yes. Uh, good, a little bit at least. So, and that's important, right? We talk about Genesis, God rests on the yep. seventh day. Um, and we're, we're not made, know, made to work every single day. Right. And God actually wants us to enjoy what he has done. Um, so there you go. That is vacation. Theology vacation yep. right there. Uh, so good. So this week we're going to finish up Genesis. Anything that you kind of noted before we get started into the main meat of it all? Um, I don't know, the story of Joseph is always kind of a, a nice one. It's one of those more well-known ones. You know, you got the coat of many colors and um, the famine and all those stories, Joseph's dreams. You all kind of, those are mm. classic Sunday school stories. Right. Um, so this is kind of, it takes the bulk of Genesis, actually. Yeah. I think he gets the most, the most of the most story. Yep. Um, and we'll so, get into the reason why I think that is, too, when we okay. get into our text. Um, but yeah, but just fan, you know, we were reading with the, the sun, uh, on Sunday after church, you know, we did the reading through the Bible. And at the end, I asked them, like, what sticks out to you about the text? Where, what do you observe? And they said just the kind of the, the punch of the story itself. Um, you, can, you get that with um, Jacob and Esau, right? You know, they hate each other and they're meeting up and Jacob is terrified because the last time thing that he knew from Esau is that Esau wants him dead. Um, and so they're meeting, and the text literally plays out with, you're thinking as Esau dive tackles him that, okay, this is the part where Esau takes his knife mm. and Jacob's dead. Um, but all of a sudden it turns, the text is like, they're kissing and hugging, and you're like, oh, and it's a powerful, it's really powerful. Uh, and then Joseph, right? It, same thing. Yeah, the same. You're, it's tension. We know that it's Joseph, but the brothers don't know. This is good literary stuff. Um, and so we're in on the secret. And we can see then how God has played throughout all this. And, you know, we're still in Summer of Thunder here. But yet the power of that narrative really kind of drives things forward to the point when Joseph says, I am Joseph. You're just like, it, it, you almost like feel that punch too. Like, wow. Um, Good climax to a movie. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it is. So just, and they, we, as we read that out loud together on Sunday, it was kind of cool to kind of you, you hear that. And you're like, yeah, just imagine that. What's well, another... Um, you should read the Bible out loud. Um, yeah. It's it's weird a little bit, but even when you're on your own, you should try reading it out loud because it does give a different emphasis to the text. You tend, have a tendency to pick up on those things more yeah. when they're read aloud. Oh, well, even when you read it in your head, right? There's that tendency even to to kind of skip over. It. Like your yeah, mind will jump you things. Scan things. Yeah, especially if you're familiar with it. Yeah. I mean, that's the challenge for me as a pastor when it comes to preaching. Like the hardest texts to preach are the the easy ones, like the ones like you're most Luke familiar. Two. Yeah. <laughs> And also, you're just, you're just kind of like, I know this story, and you know, I know the details. I've heard it so many times, uh, but the importance of actually slowing down and considering what's happening. And some, the best way to do that is to read it out loud. Yeah. Read out um, loud, or read a different translation too. Also right. helps. Yep, that's why we learn Greek and Hebrew. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so fun stuff like that. Um, just a couple of those fun observations with the text and all that. So good. Uh, as you can see, also before I forget, our, what's between our two Bibles today, um, I, I really benefit. This book is called How to Read the Bible with Understanding. Um, I used this when I was in college. Actually, my Old Testament class, we had to read through this as an older edition. Um, but he does a great job covering how should you read prophecy? How, do you, how should you read poetry? How do you read the historical things in the Bible? Um, he even goes into like the translations of the Bible. So how do you look, how should you like the ESV compare to the NIV and the NASB and the KJV and, and the message translation and, and what's kind of the, the translation philosophy. And so he even gets into that, like when you pick a Bible to read from, what should you look for? Because not all Bibles are created with the same intent with the translation. Um, so just good stuff like that. So if you're ever interested, this is in our church library. This is actually the copy from our church library. Uh, so stop on by and pick some of this out because um, you'll see some kind of cool things 
You can check it out for up to two months. Check outs up to two months. Card in the back. Fill out. If you ever want to check out anything from the library, old fashioned card system. Yeah. It works Fill it well. out, leave the card, bring the book back in a couple months. Boom. So yeah, so there's our Between Two Bibles advertisement for you here mm -hmm. today. All right, well, let's dig into the text then. Well, um, first we're going to have you talk about Christ-like figures. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is important. probably one of the key things when you guys are reading through the Bible and, you know, something that you kind of, know, you pick up on more as you read to the characters is that, you know, sometimes weird things happen to these characters or... Um, something that just seems out of place, like uh, Abraham, like go sacrifice your son Isaac. Okay, what, what in the world? The world. <laughs> um, or Joseph, you know, this entire thing as we read here in the book of Joseph, you see this with him too. And as you go on through the Bible, pick out the major characters that you kind of stay with for a while, uh, because you'll see this come out very clearly. So David, you know, he's probably one of the clearest examples. Uh, there's even a part where he's walking out of Jerusalem and people are pelting him, you know, mocking him. Uh, and what happens to Jesus on his crucifixion, and this is what's happening to him. Um, you'll see these characters will start having things in their life that really echoes, Old Testament, it'll echo forward to Jesus. And you're like, well, this, this happens to Jesus. So when you read in your New Testament, you're like, wait a minute, I remember that being talked about with Abraham. I remember that happening to Joseph. I remember this to David. And it's like, exactly. Um, you're supposed to see these characters playing out, and what's happening to them in their life, all of a sudden, Christ starts, it happens to him. Um, and so all these Old Testament characters and these situations and these stories will then come out in the New Testament. Uh, so with Joseph, right, we'll, we'll talk about that with him here too. As we read through Genesis 37 through 50, you see this so clearly. Um, I love when Joseph kind of, he starts in a high point, right? He's the beloved son. He's the favorite son of his father. Um, and he gets, you know, he's, He's coded in what's a distinct, it's translated a, a coat of many colors, but really the Hebrew is as a very distinct garment. Highly ornamental. Yeah, so probably something that is expensive. It means dad sat down and took a lot of time to make it. And none of the other brothers got this. Um, so he, he starts with this, you know, he's, you know, from his rise until his fall, he's coming down, he's humbled. Um, he's and betrayed. He's betrayed, right, by his, his own people, his own brothers. Um and then all of a sudden he has this rise where he sits that Pharaoh's right hand, that he's Pharaoh's right hand man. Uh, and so you, the part where you get in the text and you're like, holy smokes, this, this is Jesus. This is exactly what happens to him. Uh, in fact, what's Joseph at the end, it, you know, chime in if you kind of catch this too, but um, what does he say at the end to his brothers about why he was sent there? Do you remember that? It was, well, it was for God's purpose so that they would be saved. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Which is exactly the reason why, right? You, you, what you can apply to Jesus. What we we have done against him by nailing him to the tree was we did it for evil, right? We want to kill him. Um, but what God did, God sent him there to save. Uh, so this applies right into the life of Christ, um, because Joseph was the end. He saves the world. He does. Uh, he is the blessing from Abraham's line to the nations, because all the nations of the earth are blessed. Yeah, it really is. Because they say the famines and all the nations and all the nations come to yeah. Egypt to get this, to get the yeah. food that Egypt has. So he really does. It saves yeah. the world. Uh, so when you see us, when we talk about like a Christ-like figure, and you have this still today, and mo movies will do this still. Mm -hmm. um, so if you ever watching a movie or something like that, pick out something that also you're like, wait a minute, that happened to Jesus. Uh, because they're trying to pick point that out. Um, biblical theology, this is what we call typology. Um, there's a type, like, uh, this is a typewriter here yeah. and that letter, the letter is the type. And then when it hits the page, it's the anti-type. Um, and so the type in the old Testament is like Joseph or the temple or the sacrifices or the golden, uh, the, um, the bronze serpent. Uh, you can just, you can list tons of these here. Um, and it's then the anti-type is Jesus. The, yeah. Fulfilled in the new Testament. Right. So Jesus will fulfill them in a greater way. And, and Jesus will do this, right? Uh, I am the bread that came down from it. Your fathers ate the manna. So the, the bread in the Old Testament, the manna that comes down, is but a foreshadowing to Jesus. He was the rock where the water came from. Yeah. Uh, so you but get this. Jesus isn't just in the prophecies in the Old Testament. He's in the Old Testament. Yeah. <laughs> he literally is the Old Testament, almost. Yeah. And, that's, and, and that's, once again, this is the story of the Bible kind of telling itself. Um, and still modern, good, you know, Western civilization, we still do this. Like in our books, there is a call back to a Christ-like figure. 
Um, so like what, you know, you get some of the same stories right. over and over again, Harry Potter, right? Even JK Rowling maybe unconsciously still does this, you know, Harry dies and he, he's resurrected, comes back. Spoiler alert. Spoiler. <laughs> um, right. But there's a, he's saying on behalf and what his sacrifice then protects, puts a magical charm on his loved ones, mm. protects them. Um, that's very Christ-like. Um, so you see this. So if a character is betrayed, who's the hero or someone who, He's the chosen one. He's the Christ figure of the book. Uh, one of my favorite movies of the modern era is The Man of Steel. That is the story of Jesus retold. Like, is one of my, I, I still find dozens of references to Christianity in that movie because that actually the director even said he purposefully did it that way. Um, so it's, it's like you know, C.S. Lewis good. and the Chronicles of Narnia. That's almost a very direct yeah. example of that. Yeah, Aslan. He's yeah. literally the Christ. He dies in the second of the line, which yeah. he drove. Uh, so the Bible, and this, they're getting all this. This is not something we've made up. This is something that the Bible actually does. Uh, so as you read your Bibles, find where people are like, wait, Jesus does that. And it's like, yeah, because it's trying to get you to see Jesus in the Old Testament and what Jesus is going to do. So yeah, so that's probably the best, you know, talking about reading your Bibles, Old Testament stuff um, of where we see characters looking like Jesus. And this will happen to Paul, too. He becomes a Christ-like figure in the book of Acts. Um, yeah, his story starts looking a lot like Jesus' story. So but good. Unlike Jesus, they can't save everyone. Right, so there's a limitation yeah. to these characters. Jesus is the ultimate example of it. So right. These are like the shadows of him. Yeah, and, that, and that's a really good point, too, right? So even Joseph here in the book, at the end, you're, you're, what we're supposed to think of Joseph at the end of Genesis is that this is the guy, right? We, we, Eve, at the beginning, thinks it's Cain, right? Finally, we've beholden the man. Um, you get this with Noah, right? His father, man, he'll be a comfort to us. And he does a little bit, but Noah sins. Uh, you get this with, you know, Abraham. He's carrying on the promise. He's told, through your descendant will come a Savior who's going to bless everyone. And so you're like, okay, is this Isaac? Well, no, Isaac dies. Jacob, well, he's a wily <laughs> son of a gun here. Um, you know, the 12 brothers, well, you read the back half with the, the brothers, well, they all try to cheat and kill their brother Joseph. Reuben sleeps with his father's servant, um, a midwife there, uh, the um, servant of his, was it his Bilha, I think it is? Yeah. Um, and so that, you know, disqualifies him from the blessing. Uh, Simeon and Levi, that with uh, when uh, their sister Dinah there is raped and everything, they pay back by killing all, everyone in the town and then taking the women and children. So you're like, you know? Uh, so, wow, really, God is going to save the world through this family. And so you get to the end of the book, and you're like, Joseph, he's the guy. Like, he's the one we've been waiting for. And then, and then he dies. Dies. <laughs> and he's like, no, no, God is going to just still yet do something. And when he does, carry my bones out of here. Um, don't leave me in the land of Egypt. So don't leave me behind when you all get saved, right? Take me with you. Um, and we'll find out when we get to the book of Exodus, they do. And in the book of Joshua, he finally gets buried in the promised land. Uh, so yeah, so we get, we get to the point where they are shadows, but they are not the figure themselves. And we're waiting then as the book of Genesis ends, we're almost disappointed. We're like, no, oh, well, yeah. let's turn the page and keep reading. That's, a, that's another important thing. I kind of just thought of this, but you almost have to read each book of the Bible as its own thing too. I mean, you read it as yeah. a big narrative, but you also have to read it as its own thing. So Genesis starts with, Creation's good, and then creation falls, and then there's that initial promise. And so that promise does, that that idea follows through the rest of Genesis. And so you kind of have a theme of Genesis, and so you kind of have to read Genesis as one narrative. And then you move on to Exodus. Obviously, the first five books were all written by Moses, so they are one kind of right. connected narrative. But Genesis kind of tells its own story, and then Exodus tells its own story. And yeah. um, so on, they each have a purpose, and you have to keep that in mind as you're reading them, too. Right. And you know, you know, there's a side tail in here, but when you get to the, the Gospels, people will try to do that too, where they'll try to harmonize the Gospels. And there's a point where it's kind of cool trying to figure out the exact how does yeah. this all fit together. But at the same time, each book kind of Has speaks its for itself. And you really can't try to smush them together because it kind of ruins their witness and their yeah. point. Uh, and you start muddying the waters a bit. So there's always kind of like that, no, 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 there are four, you know, witnesses the, to the I same read that event. The, the feeding of the 5,000 is in all four, and they said that you should, you kind of get all the details mixed up that are told in the different ones, but you kind of almost have to read them in each book because there, there's a different purpose with yeah. each one, um, each telling of it. So if you try to smush them up, you do lose something. Yeah. Which, back then to our advertisement here, this book actually covers that, like how you should mm -hmm. read in context and you should read in the book. 
So there you go. If you want more on that discussion, here's your, how to read a Bible it's also understanding. It's, it's also why it's good to read a book all together. Yeah. Um, that's why you should sit down and read all of Genesis in bigger chunks. It's actually yeah. helpful. Um, read all of a gospel. Sit down and read Mo Gospel of Mark all the way through. Yeah. Um, because it's meant to be read that way in some respects. Yep. Yeah. Amen. So, good. okay. Should we get on to Joseph? Let's do it. So. What do you know about Joseph? He's kind of annoying at the beginning. Okay. You know, you kind of don't, in some ways, blame the brothers for being... So critical of him? Yeah, because he's the, he's the favorite son, which, you know, right. you start playing favorites, and Joseph rats on them, and he kind of... Yeah. He has the, his dream about them all bowing down to him and tells them that. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's kind of like he's gloating. That, you know, it's kind of prideful. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's 17 when he's um, sold to the Ishmaelites, but... You know, so he's kind of a typical teenage boy. You know, yep. he has that pride. He probably it doesn't have a lot of critical thinking yet, and right. isn't um, really so. He obviously doesn't. Um, the brothers are still at fault, but you kind of get why they were annoyed with him. Yeah, um, and you know, as you were saying that, this is connected with me. You know, he's seventeen when he's sold into Egypt. He's thirty when he becomes Pharaoh's right hand man, um, and it isn't until the uh -huh. um, there's seven years of the plenty. And then, and then like there's two, two more three, years, because yeah. there's five years when the brothers first come. So you're thinking of that, what, is, what does that put him then? There's 37, 30, 40. almost 40. So he's really gone from his father for 23 years, right? So there's 23 years in between Joseph being sold into Egypt and then when he's reunited with his father. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's a good chunk of time, right? That's two th over two, almost two-thirds of my life. That's a similar length like, of time as um, Jacob and Esau were separated, too. That was about yeah. 20 years. yeah. And so yeah, it, it just, that's just something you miss in the text if, you know, you, you see it because the dates are told yeah. you. But uh, if you're just reading it, that's something you can kind of miss too. This is yeah. a long time that he's separated for. Um, but yeah, just kind of just kind of interesting. But I do love that, going cycling back to that first point with him being kind of prideful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he, he rats on his brothers. His dad loves him. Um, he tells him dreams about how I'm so much cooler than you mm -hmm. and... I, and just think, uh, siblings, siblings, right? If yep. you're, you know, imagine <laughs> Joseph, the little brother. So Caitlin comes up to you and says, "Hey, Dana, how would you feel if you're gonna bow down to me and, and things like that?" You'd be like, Pfft, you know, or, or yeah. my younger brother, you know, came to me and said, "I'm gonna, be, you're gonna bow down to me." I'm like, okay, yeah, okay. What, what do you think? What do you yeah. think you are? Right? You're, you're a little brother. Um, to, you know, talk about another Jesus foreshadow, right? When Jesus goes to his hometown, right? Well, who does this guy think he is? We, his father is a Joseph and his mother, Mary, like, yeah. they're, they're nobody, right? Yeah. And so they, they just were told Jesus is despised in the same way. Um, yeah, so there's another Christ-like quality for Joseph for you, even though he might not have the best intentions like Jesus does yes. um, with his proud dreams. Uh, right? And I love being called, look at this dreamer. Here's, uh, here comes the dreamer again, right? It's a derogatory name for him. Yeah. Well, what else about Joseph? Oh, well, we can get into a bit of the story. So um, Joseph, you know, basically his brothers plot against him and some of them want to kill him. Some of them just want to um, sell him. Um, which one? Was it Judah? Was it Judah? Or it's Reuben, Reuben, Reuben who wants to save his life. Reuben who wants to save his life. It's the eldest. Yep. Um, and so they end up throwing him... Throwing him into a cistern, which is basically a dry well, because yeah. um, essentially it's a hole in the ground that he can't get out of on his own. Um, and Reuben's like, okay, I'll come back and save him, because they were just going to leave him down there. Um, and instead they're like, oh, we're going to sell them to yeah. the Ishmaelites, which right. the Ishmaelites would be Ishmael, which would be... Um, his family. Yeah. yeah, so these are like their second cousins, actually. <laughs> um, so this is, you know, the, the descendants of Ishmael. And there he gets sold, um, right. which that's actually later commanded against selling people um, in the um, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, one of those, one of the yeah. laws books. But so, and, so Joseph ends up in Egypt. Yeah. Uh, talk, and here's the thing. Some people who will read their Bible and kind of note things will call out a discrepancy here because initially we're told that there's Ishmaelite traders who come by and then we're told they're Midianite traders and then later on, again, we're told that they're Ishmaelite traders. And then when Joseph gets to Egypt, we're told that the Midianites sell him. And so people who are reading this will say, whoa, 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 hold on. Here's a discrepancy here that, who is it? Is it Ishmaelites or Midianites? Um, 
And usually the answer for this is, well, one, this is probably a famous trade route. So there's probably several people. So you can almost imagine maybe that the Midianites and Ish they're kind of haggling yeah. over, like, well, we'll give you, like, five more shekels for him or, you know, stuff like that. Or the, the very fact, too, that um, when we're talking about these people groups, that there's kind of a relation here. And so you can almost wax between the names as well. Who knows? Maybe the sons of Ishmaelite, you know, mixed they with the people of Midian, too. Yeah. Um, so there's that. So a lot of people will, will see that, though, on the surface and kind of, like, get freaked out. So, like, well, which one is it? Um, so this is one of those discrepancy things that people yeah, freak out about, not really. but not too big of a deal. So. Yeah. It but could yeah. have been, yeah, that they were somehow connected and yep. simple explanations. Yes. So that's what, don't freak out when you do see dis supposed discrepancies in the Bible because often the simple explanation is just the explanation. Right. Um, the truth so. is, some, you know, people always try to find some weird answer too. And yeah. sometimes it just... It might just be, I mean, because we have multiple names for stuff all the time. I right. mean, like, take um, the wood in town. We call it the wood. It's UW Marshfield Wood County, but now it's UW Stevens Point. You know right. which one is it? Yeah. Um, yes. It's all of them. <laughs> yeah. So it's technically UW. Now it's UWSP at Marshfield. It used to be UW Marshfield Wood County, so that's what a lot of people still call it. But everyone still just calls it the Wood because that's the nickname for it. Or Atrium down the road, right? What yeah. is even before it was Atrium, it was called something else. And yeah. It's atrium. Now it's Marshfield Health Services. Yeah. So we still call it Atrium because it's, it's just what you do. So yeah. same thing here in the text. It's like which one is it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lutherans um, like that answer. Yeah. Is it this it one works. or that one? Yes. Yes. Uh, but yeah, people sometimes will freak out about that. And mm -hmm. I've heard that comment a few times too. So good. Um, so Joseph, you know, he gets sold into Egypt. But before that, we do get a really weird, like, I guess some, here's another thing that people will say that the text here is not written by mo your critical scholars, your higher, crit higher critics. Here they'll say that this is a bunch of random editors hundreds of years later who just say, yeah, good enough. And I'll just put these stories together. Um, because you do it, and it seems at the surface, like, what is chapter 38 doing? Um, that would be Judah, correct? Yeah, you get this yeah. story about Judah. So Joseph is sold into Egypt, and you're thinking, okay, we're going to continue the narrative with Joseph in Egypt. Eh, you're with Judah. And a really weird story. In fact, several weird things happen in it with Judah's children. Uh, and then Judah himself. And, you know, this, you know, Boom. But what, I don't know, what are some things that strike you about this chapter? Um, well, first, you, you, well, you get the whole story of um, Judah has three sons. Yeah. And the first son marries, um, that's Tamar, right? Yep. Okay, okay, yeah, Tamar. Um, and then the first son is wicked. Er, no, yeah, is er, yeah. Is killed by God, it basically says. Yep. Um, and so at that time, it was the custom, essentially, that if a widow died without children that the next eldest brother would basically you know have a child with her yep. um that would that child would actually belong to the brother who had died yep. um and this is you know one of those weird customs and it seems to at least you know having children in this family line was really important because we know yeah. you know from the seed that's where Jesus is going to come out of this so that's kind of where the weird it's a weird cultural thing that we don't really get now but right. um so yeah, so basically then the second son dies because he refuses basically to do this yep. and have a child for his brother because he's like, well, the child will belong to my brother, not me. Yep. Um, and so he's put to death and then the third child is quite old enough. Right. We don't know how old he is. I mean, he could have just been a couple years younger than, you know, could have been right. like 16, 17. And, you know, we don't really know the ages of all these people. Um, and so he's like, dude, just like, wait until my youngest son is old enough to marry you and then he'll marry you. Um, well, then the kid gets old enough and isn't given to Tamar, and possibly because Judah's thinking he's going to die too, because, right. you know, his first two sons died, <laughs> and what's the common thing? Tamar. Um, but, <laughs> so poor Tamar, but, so then Tamar's like, I'm going to, you know, basically she dresses up like a prostitute, yep. puts her place where her father-in-law is going to see her, her father-in-law sleeps with her, and there's this whole thing where she gets pregnant with twins and right. another set of twins. Right. Um, and, yeah, it is it is kind of an odd, random side story. It is. But the importance of it is actually, Tamar actually does show up in the genealogy of Jesus. Right. So Perez, right? Yeah, yes. Perez. Um, there's, there's the two women who show up in the genealogy. Three. three. Ta there's Tamar there's and Ruth. Ruth. Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Yeah. That was, a, okay. So these are the three women and it's, um, yeah, they all have interesting stories. Right. Um, yeah. 
So Jesus isn't afraid of the human race's muddy blind. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, that's so that's where the importance of the story comes in. It's because right. this is where the the line continues down to Jesus. Yeah. Um, it's not through Joseph like you might expect. Yeah. So and this kind of, you know talking about here we've been tracing the promise through the Old Testament. Where does Jesus come in? So you know Adam to Noah to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Well, who's the next one? Judah, because Reuben, he's the oldest, but guess what? He messed up that blessing. Simeon and Levi, they killed that whole town's worth of people, and so they're, you know, jumped out of this. And then it's given to Judah. And so Judah's given the promise and the blessing of the Messiah. Uh, so it's through his loins, which of course then is why Ur and Onan are put to death, because God will not have them be part of this line if they're not going to participate in that. So they're put to death. They basically um, deny the promise. Yeah, they deny bringing Christ into the picture. So they don't want to have Jesus. And even though they might not know that, they don't want Jesus to come. That is what they're doing. So God puts them to death. Okay, you don't want that? You're cut off. Um, so we get that. But then there's an important thing here because you're like, why is this here? Like, why are we focusing on Judah here? Why can't we just get Joseph? And then maybe at the end we can mention this about Judah. All right. Well, it sets up a really important contrast because what happens to Joseph in the next chapter? We find because he does go to Egypt, and what happens to him? Um, well, he rises. He gets sold to um, Potiphar, yep. um, who actually was a captain of the guard. Yeah. Um, so he's actually kind of an important person, um, and Joseph basically rises to prominence in this um, household and basically becomes kind of the head servant in a way. Um, has a lot of power and. Um, is given control, you know, he's basically the steward of his master's property. Um, and the Potiphar's wife basically tries to um, seduce, seduce Joseph. Yeah. And Joseph isn't having any of it. He, you know, keeps, you know, saying, no, I'm not going to, you know, my, you're my master's wife and he has not given you to me. Yep. Um, and so Joseph is kind of upstanding in the situation and Potiphar's wife um, basically gets mad about this and essentially accuses him of trying to rape her and um, he leaves behind his cloak when he's escaping yep. and so she has as this cloak as yeah. proof that mm -hmm. um, and so Potiphar throws Joseph in prison then. Um, Wait, is that, what's afraid hell hath no theory like a woman scorned <laughs> right and that's what happens to her um, but this guy you know Notice the contrast then. Judah goes and sleeps with his daughter-in-law. Uh, unbeknownst to him, but he still does it because he thinks it's a prostitute. So it makes him even worse of a character. Yeah. And then here's Joseph, who is in Egypt. And it really just, talk about a foil in the text. But you got this situation with Judah. He absolutely blows it. And then Joseph, who shows up to be rather upstanding. Um, and this is going to come, this is going to play out a little bit. We won't see Judah too much until, of course, the brothers come back in. But the words that Judah is going to say and the actions that Judah is going to take will ultimately kind of redeem Judah uh, in the narrative. So really, this whole section about Joseph here, it, while it does focus in on him, it really ultimately becomes about the redemption of Judah uh, as a character, as a person in the story, um, as one who will then carry forth the blessings of Jesus. Uh, so you'll see that when when Judah is offering, you know, what do I give to some, what do I give to this woman here as a pledge? He gives the staff and the signet, right? The signet ring, uh, which is kind of his, you know, it's an official seal. Yeah. Like it has his mark on it. It's, it's from him. Yeah. And it's legit. And Jesus will use this idea that the line of Judah is kind of God's signet upon humanity, that he's going to come through in this promise. And so you're just kind of like, okay, Judah, what are you doing? What are you thinking here? It's like Esau giving up his birthright almost again. Um, and then he gets it at the end, of the, at the back, at the end, uh, whoever, I, I'm pregnant by the person who owns these. And Jews like, she is more righteous than I. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Um, and it, it really just kind of emphasizes then Judah's character. Well, then at the end of the book, when, you know, and we'll get there too, but it's kind of good to connect it right now, is when Benjamin is being, all right, guess what? Benjamin stole the cup. I'm going to take him and the rest of you can go back to your dad. Well, we know that Jacob, this is the last son from Rachel. He lost Jake, Joseph, he thinks, and Benjamin's going to be gone now. And Judah throws himself on the line and says, no, take me as a pledge. Uh, so really that connection, well, that will connect that too. So really this is not, so we get back to our first point, this is not some random story in the middle of here, but it's setting up the tension and finding the redemption of Judah in the narrative. So um, this story isn't just about Joseph. 
No. Yeah, it's, it's far about, more. It's again about the continuation of the promised seed. Yeah, that's going to come from Christ. So Judah then carries on this promise, and we'll get that at the end of the book when Jacob blesses his sons. But let's push forward. Okay. J poor Joseph, he's sitting in prison, and what happens again to him? Um, well, a couple people have, well, um, he rises to prominence in the prison, too, and yeah. the prison guard is, like, basically gives him control of which... <laughs> All the prisoners. <laughs> yeah, he's a prisoner himself, but again, he, you know, God is with him, and he rises to power again. Um, it's like Shawshank and Redemption. Ever seen Shawshank I've Redemption? I've not seen that one. Go watch Shawshank <laughs> Redemption. Um, same thing happens in that movie. The prisoner becomes who is in charge of all the rest of the prisoners. But yeah, so okay. go ahead. Anyway, um, so a couple of the other prisoners have dreams, and they're sad because no one can interpret these dreams. And Joseph was like, "Well, you know, my God can, you know, interpret these dreams." And he interprets them. One of them gets um, put back, you know, into his position. The other one is um, beheaded or hanged or whatever. He's killed. Um, and the I think it's the cupbearer that goes back. Yep. Yeah. So the cup he tells the cupbearer. Um, Remember me when, you know, you're back in power, you know, you your position. You come into your kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, you know, the cupbearer doesn't remember him. Another two years go by. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, the pharaoh has a dream that he, you know, a couple dreams that he doesn't know how to interpret it. Um, first one was it seven seven fat cows are eaten by seven lean cows. Yep. And then I forget the other one. Seven, the corn seven, seven good corn stalks get eaten by seven bad corn stalks. Yep. Um, and, you know, Pharaoh's, you know, there's no one who can interpret this dream, and the cupbearer is like, oh, wait, um, I remember there was someone in prison who, you Tell know. Tell me what I dreamed. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so out comes Joseph to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. Um, and so basically, you know, Joseph is then, you know, as, again, as a kind of, you know, good witness that, you know, I can't interpret them, but my God can kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so the power doesn't come from him. And those, he's learned that, right? Yeah. And getting there, he's like, look what this dream is about, right? And yeah. Like, but now he's kind of been, he's humbled. humbled. So he, he can now take these, what God has given, and use them properly. Um, which probably, I don't know, that's probably a good point to bring up our dreams, right? Yes. Um, because when you read this, and this will happen in the book of Daniel. So Daniel replays this from Genesis when Daniel has to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream and uh, all Cyrus and all that. Um, and it, it makes you wonder, okay, because people will still try to do some of these things today, right? They'll take, I had a dream, and, and this is what it must be. I, I remember I took psychology in high school, and it was, it was one of the first times, like, this is, what is this? Yeah. Because we actually had a dream segment, and we had to read a book about what certain things and dreams mean, and so we were trying to interpret dreams. So literally one day in class, our teacher said, remember a dream you had and look up pieces and tell me what the dream was about. And it was just so like okay, this is it turns into like some mystical yeah. um, a thing that God's trying to communicate so, something. Usually, to you. dreams are either a replay of something that happened to your life or some yeah. Like right. I dream about spiders when I'm stressed. Oh, yeah. Usually, and I know that, but it doesn't mean it means anything. It just me saying I'm stressed. Yeah. So it's not this grand message. Right. So it's something you know, it's something that we can learn from our bodies that, you know, like that is making you realize, oh maybe I'm really stressed. I need to take a break yeah. or something. Um but sometimes when people will go like God's trying to say something to yeah. me. And it's right, we want to be careful because at the same time it's not that God can't use these means, but it's not that we should look to them for that. Yeah. That's kind we of like how we should expect it or yeah. uh, this is not where we think God should talk to us. No. Right? Especially when it contradicts scripture right because a lot of times that's what people use these as a something that yeah counteracts it's like yeah. you know well this dream means god wants me to do this but that goes against my vocation as yeah. you know a mother wife you know daughter or whatever yeah and um so that's yeah and also you know we don't need dreams to know what god wants from us and you yeah. know if the old you know that's how god did talk to people yeah. sometimes and um, he was, uh, yeah. In many various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets, but now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, right? Yeah, so, which is literally, you know, the go. words in the Bible. So. Right. so, right, we should always take that and remember that too. And to also remind ourselves that there's not just God out there who can use dreams. One, my sinful flesh, mm. right? So all of a sudden it's like, hey, you should do this. And it's like, oh, well, that was a dream. Maybe it was God speaking to me. It's like, mm. No. Right, you know that, that goes against God's will, um, what He has already defined, and then also some people, you know, or maybe there's demonic. You know, we're we're told in the scriptures how the, the devil and his demons can conjure up 
you know, false images and things like that. So we should always be careful um, when it comes to dreams like that. And we shouldn't take, once again, here's that last week we talked about description and prescription. Just because God speaks to Joseph here in the, or Pharaoh um, doesn't always mean that when a dream happens, therefore, this is God trying to say something. That's not a promise given to us that right. God is going to, he never says that God's going to yep. talk to us through a dream. So can he? Oh, yeah, because yeah. it text out, but should we expect that? No. And, and that, once again, leads us to be discerning about these kind of things. So, yeah, that's probably a good tangent for something like uh, along those lines. Um, to, I think, actually, this book kind of covers into some of that kind of stuff, too. It's a good book. It is a good book. Um, oh. So... Yeah, so okay, he okay. dreams, he, he gets the interpretation. Yeah, the interpretation is basically that there are going to be seven years of famine, or seven years of good years of, you know, abundance, great crops, and then seven years of famine. Right. Um, and so just so that basically also gives Pharaoh a plan. He's like, you know, store up one fifth of the, you know, the harvest each year so that you're all set for the seven years of famine. Yeah. So that is exactly what happens. Pharaoh gives Joseph a ton of power, yeah. and Joseph is put in charge of this. He's basically second in command in Egypt. Pharaoh's right-hand man, right? He yeah. sits on the right hand of Pharaoh Almighty, right? That's yeah. how you might would say that. Um, notice here, too, how the book of Genesis is bracketed. Uh, we began by God creating in seven day, and at the end here we get this kind of seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, so it's almost like a bracket in the text that kind of forms an inclusio here. Um, so this is why we can also say kind of the beginning here of the end of the book of Genesis is really highlighting this God's action. Um, good. So yeah, so he finally gets out, and then I love what happens. Uh, he's second in command. He's, you know, done everything right, and then who should come along in the story but his brothers, finally. Um, and what do they do when they first come in fulfillment of his dream? They bow down. Yeah. <laughs> I love it, right? So he had two dreams where his brothers bowed down, and here we get the fulfillment of the first one, right? They come and they, they prostrate themselves. I was wondering a bit if that's what, what, at that moment, is when he was like, actually uh, recognized them. Yeah. You know, like where he was kind of like, up till that point. Yeah, it's like, are, are they, they them? Yeah. And then they bow down, and he's like, maybe like, yeah. it, that clicks. I kind of, you know, wonder well, about that. Even in the text there, too, um, we're told it's not until, let me see if I can find it here. It's the brothers go to Egypt. Um, <laughs> let's see if I can find it here quickly. Because uh, it's shortly after they bow down, too, that he remembers his dream. Um, yeah. In the text, I can't find it right now. Oh, not at verse 9. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed ah. of them, and he said to them, you're spies. Yeah. Um. So <laughs> his remembrance of his dream kickstarts this whole entire scheme of his to find out where his brother's at. Right? Are they still these lying, cheating, murdering brothers that he last saw them as 20 yeah. plus years ago? Well, so this seems um, like a very extended story that's going on, yeah. but it is him trying, you know, because the last time he saw his brothers... They first tried to kill him and then sold him into slavery. Yep. Um, so it's this kind of way of come. And for us, you know, put yourself, you don't know that this is Joseph. Right? You think this is the second most powerful man on earth, right? This is, you know, the vice president that you were going before, and you're you're saying this, and all of a sudden he starts making threats at you and saying you're spies, we're gonna lie. You'd be like, well, we're in trouble, right? The FBI is gonna be knocking on my door tomorrow to drag me <laughs> off or something like that. Um, it, it, you're just kind of concerned. And, uh, so, but they don't know, but we as the reader who know, we know that they're okay, right? That Joseph is merely testing them here. And you know, talk about, you know, in our life too, where we see God maybe is, we're afraid, you know, there, there's a threat here. There's a, um, it appears that God is the enemy, but yet at the same time, we can know from this story how God also works. He kind of hides himself that, you know, that everything's going to turn out okay because he's the one who's in control, even though it, doesn't appear to be the case here. In fact, they kind of assume that this is God avenging Joseph on them. Um, right? This is because we treated Joseph so badly that this is happening to us. Um, so I love it. The first visit, you know, they kind of are tested then, and they have to leave. Is it Simeon, I think, behind? Yeah, I think um, so. So leave Simeon here behind as proof, right? It's kind of the, um, you know, you got to have some leverage here. Because if you just let them go, they won't be back, and you won't see them ever again. Yeah, he wants um, to make sure they... He wants to see his, you know, full brother, Benjamin, again. Yep. And also it's kind of that assurance. If they are changed men, they'll come back. But if they're the same thing, they're almost like, let's cut our losses like we did with our brother Joseph. And um, 
go forward here. Well, so it seems like it's, it was a while before they came back the second time, though, yeah. too, because their food ran out again. and so you know, Several months, at least. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, this isn't a quick journey, either. Yeah, it's not like pick and save where yeah. I'm hungry again a week later. Let's go back yeah, and get some grain. So this, is this, probably, is... this is probably several months later that they return. So, yeah, the brothers all leave. They... Um, tell their father what happened and their father's really distressed about this and you know course, he's now lost another son right i am um, and you just feel you just feel jacob well one yeah. it's almost like jacob he's been a lion and a trickster this whole time and it's almost kind of you're thinking jacob's getting what's coming to him now too yeah. um and even the talk about the narrative punch uh in the hebrew even when they find out they say hey is this joseph's um coat here that's covered in blood and things like that the text is even really short and very like Curt and to blunt to the point where Joseph, he just says, it is. That, it, that's all he says about it. And the Hebrew is like, it's my sons. and things. But the Hebrew is just really brief. And it's like, oh, it just kind of hits you at home. That's what the text is supposed to do. Uh, all he has is, he's almost speechless. Like, it is Joseph. It's just sad. Um, and here now Joseph is, I'm going to go down to Sheol in misery. Like, you guys are stealing my descendants from me. Um, yeah, and of course, they're even more upset because what's in their sack when they open it up when they get it? All of, all of the silver they used right. to pay for it, so they're thinking, <laughs> We just <"Wait."> stole. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So they do end up then going back to Egypt to get more food, because otherwise they are going to starve, um, and, you know, get Simeon back. And they do bring Benjamin this time, because otherwise um, Joseph said he wouldn't see them. And they bring twice as much silver, because they're like, you know. Yeah. You know. Um, and so this time, instead of being accused of being spies, they're actually given a big meal big banquet right they're um, like, oh, hometown heroes almost yeah and their first clue that something really weird is going on is that they're placed in um age order at the table yeah, yeah. which i always find funny because um yeah because i mean they wouldn't be pretty close in age so looking at them unless you knew them you wouldn't know you know which one goes you know which one's the eldest because they're probably all within 10 15 years at most probably apart right um so anyway so they return they have the meal they get more food um they get sent away, but Joseph um, has one of his servants put his good silver Person cup in Benjamin's food sack. Yeah. So he gets sent, you know, they, he sends his servants after his brothers then, you know, to find this, the cup in the sack. And, you know, they're like, well, if one of us has it, you know, the, whatever they say, you can, you know. You can take us or whatever, take that and person. Kill us and, you know, yeah. Yeah, and kill and then, him. And... and then it's Benjamin, and they're like, oh no. We're, you know, we promised to bring Benjamin back to our father, right. um, which is where Judah comes in again. And he throws himself at the mercy um, of Joseph, uh, though they don't know it's him yet. And, you know, this begs, you know, trade my life for his, which kind of, once again, Joseph now sees that his brothers have changed. They're not the same men that they were. Uh, there's a repentance here. There's kind of that humble. They've been you know, brought low. And now here, you know, God opposes the proud but exalts the lowly. And it's kind of like he, yeah. he almost can't, like, can't wait. Like, oh, he just wants Joseph to say at this point. And, and so he holds back just a little bit longer. And, and it's really hard. We find out that Joseph is a very emotional man. I think he cries three different yeah. times. Like he runs out of the room even and cries because he, he's first time his brothers are arguing. And he's almost worried like, oh, great, they're the same people that they were. Uh, and then here now when jo Judah throws himself at the mercy and says, no, take me, let Benjamin go home. I'll die. Like, I'll be your slave. Um, and then he, he, you know, cries again and we're told that the whole household hears it. And, and I love that it's probably the most powerful, it's probably the climax of the book of Genesis. That everything now kind of pops, uh, all the themes that have been leading kind of come here. Uh, Joseph reveals himself and I love it because, you know, he puts everyone out, get everyone, get out. And it's just, he's crying and it's just his brothers. And there's a just powerful, I'm Joseph, you know, and imagine if you're sitting there, you're like, <laughs> You're, you're, and then like they're beside themselves. And I think that even yeah. says that in the text there that they had no idea what to say back to him. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're so, like, what, really? Yeah. Um, mm. I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. Um, you see this sometime, uh, um the resurrection of Jesus, when he comes into the room and shocked and disbelieving at what they were seeing, no one said a thing. And so Jesus said, do you guys have any fish around? Uh, and, you know, and here's a fish. So you get this another echo here that, you know, this is, un this is unexpected. This is something that they weren't looking for. Um, but yet here God had worked this you know, almost decades in the making uh, to achieve this, which is kind of fun. It's a, it's a talk about a decades old payoff here that God's waiting for. 
Um, so just a fantastic climax of that. And then, of course, you know, he, he wants to see his father, you know, because yeah. he was his favorite son. He loved his father. Um, there's this kind of reunion. We can even see there, too, the, the longing for Christ to return to his father in the book of John. Like, I'm going back to my father. And that longing that Jesus has to return to him, too. Um, so, yeah, so just, you know, a couple of the echoes here of Jesus as well. Uh, so the brothers go back, and they bring Joseph. And then kind of, how does the story kind of start final? What, what's the kind of start? final setup of the story um basically the the whole family which is like 70 people direct yeah. descendants of um jacob settle in egypt um you know they get to meet pharaoh and he's like you can settle in this area because that's you know where the shepherds settle basically um and so they live i forget how much they live. basically that's where um um israel dies Yep. Um, and <clears throat> he's lived with his son for 17 years. He yeah. did 17 years that, which is you yeah. Know, well, he was yeah. old when you know. Yeah. It's it's crazy to me how many times people are like in the Bible, I'm old, I'm gonna die soon, and then they live another like 20 years. And, yeah. Because um, um, Isaac did that too, I think. Yeah. Because he's still alive after the 20 years after Jacob's gone right. you know afraid of esau and EA. so it's kind of the same thing here in a way so he um is taken back um and is buried um back in canaan in the promised land um and then jacob i forget how much longer um joseph lives yeah jacob lived 147 years and then uh he blesses he basically adds joseph's two sons to him um, yep. So they're part of the, the 12 yeah, tribes yep. of Israel, um, which that's always a little confusing, the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's not really 12. There's yeah. <laughs> 13, because there's 12 sons, but there's technically 13 tribes, but there's only 12 that get territory. Yep. So, because the Levites don't get territory because they're the priests. Right. Um, so. And this will always get, so Revelation will mess that up too, because I think they include Joseph and they include Eph Ephraim or Manasseh, yeah. but they leave out Dan and another, and then Levi's inserted yeah. in there, and there's reasons for that, but yeah. we, we'll so get there when we get to yeah, Revelation. so the, the 12 but tribes are a little... Anyway, they're they're yeah. used theologically in the Bible yeah. for many different and reasons. Yeah. Here's another situation of the the younger getting the elder's Bless. blessing. You know, um, Jacob crosses his hands yeah. there. Um, um, so, you know, he's dim and he can't see just like Isaac, you know, but he yeah. knows, but he, so he does that. Yeah, um, so similar theme again. Um so, and then after um, Jacob dies, then Joseph's brothers are all worried. I mean, this has been, what, another 17 years? You said, yeah. And um, they're worried again that Joseph is going to still be mad at them um, now that his... Because, well, we, we see that in, you know... Jacob at, and Esau. Well, we see that in real life now that's where, true. you know, you have a funeral and that's when the family gets torn yep. apart kind of thing. Um, it was just sad and it happens, but so the brothers are worried that Joseph is going to now take it out now that their father is dead. Um, and you know, that's where Joseph is like, you grace know, is over. Yeah. 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 And now, yeah. And Joseph is like, you know, I still forgive you kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of like the repent and your sins will be forgiven kind of thing. Um, that right. theme. Um, so, yeah, and then we get, oh, we got all of Jacob's blessing his sons. I forgot about right. that Right, yeah, we'll cover this here, too. But, yeah, let's the finish the story parts. here. Um, so, yeah, so Jacob dies and is buried, and then Joseph lives and sees his, uh, what is it, his great-great-grandchildren or something, I think, doesn't yeah. it say in here? Um, uh, da, 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 I thought it said something about that in here. Oh, and Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children, yeah. So basically he sees, you know, multiple of his generations. Right. Lives 110 years. Which is the Bible's way of saying he lived a good life. Yeah. Um, right? If you if you die seeing your kids, 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 um, he lived a good life. You get that with Abraham. You get that with Job. You get that here with Joseph. Yeah. Um, so someone who is blessed by God is someone who gets to see their kids, kids kind of thing. Uh, which turns out well because right they're they're seeing the future generations of the promise going forward and so to be blessed is to see that god is still working through this line which is how the book ends um which then leaves us kind of okay god promised them a land to give them the land and the, bless, you. bless you hey just like we're gonna talk about here um the the last book the final chapters of genesis right leave you open-ended okay joseph's dead the people are in egypt but god promised to give them this land so it's setting up 
what's going to happen in the next book, Exodus, which we won't cover that in the future here because we're going to jump into Acts. And so uh, but three we hold weeks on from to now, that. we'll go back to Exodus. Yeah, and that'll be fun because Exodus is kind of the central part of the Pentateuch. It's kind of Genesis sets up everything, and then Exodus is the chief book of the Old Testament. Now, if there's a that's book one that's, they always go back to. Yeah, everything is a commentary on the book of Exodus from now on. Uh, but we'll get there here in the weeks to but come. It's a little bit like how we said uh, a couple weeks ago, how like, you know, you get Genesis 1-1, one, one, and then you get Genesis 1 is like an expounding of Genesis 1-1, yeah. one, one, and then the next few chapters are expounding of Genesis 1. Right. And now it's like Genesis itself as a whole is kind of the setup. Let, that it's let like, me tell you keep, how we got here. Yeah, <laughs> you keep setting these next parts up, and so... It's like the movie that starts like halfway and then like all of a sudden it freeze frames yeah. and says, let me tell you how I yeah. got here. And all of a sudden, Genesis 1-1. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back. Yeah. Oh. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of, it's kind of fun how well, this Exodus is how the story is where plays. Moses comes into and Moses wrote these, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of fun to see how these all kind of come into play. So I guess the last thing we talk about here for our podcast video here today is the blessings, right? Mm -hmm. The book of Genesis has been about blessing after blessing, right? Jake, uh, God blesses his creation, God blesses Adam and Eve, God blesses Noah, God blesses Abraham, he blesses Isaac, he blesses Jacob several times in his life. Jacob begs me, he's wrestling with him, give me a blessing. Uh, we're told that when Joseph is in prison, that God blesses him. Uh, Jacob, Joseph ends up being a blessing to the nations, as promised. And then finally, the last few chapters are about like this, this blessing kind of coming to fruition, even more so. And just a hint of where this blessing is going to come. This will, Jesus, obviously, is the ultimate blessing. Um, and we're told in Genesis 47, um, Joseph brings in his father Jacob to Pharaoh. And this is kind of a key moment, right? This is uh, this old man, Jacob. He's 130 years old. He's the one whom God is going to bless all the world through. And he's brought into Pharaoh. And we're told in 47.7, uh, uh, Joseph brought in Jacob, his father, and stood him before Pharaoh and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Um, so he, Pharaoh's the, kind of the leader of, I mean, yeah. he's the most powerful man in the world, actually, probably at this point. So Right. <laughs> uh, so it, isn't that just kind of something interesting? It's not Pharaoh yeah. coming to bless Jacob, but Jacob's brought in to bless Pharaoh. Yeah. Um, yeah, just kind of, a, it's almost a turn where, it, it, you know, an unexpected thing. Pharaoh, he's leader of the most powerful country in the world at the time. And here it is, this, random guy from the middle of nowhere comes in and he's the one that gives him the blessing a blessing um this is what the people of god in the old testament were designed to do this is what god gave them to do to be a blessing to everyone else um, we'll see as the old testament plays out that this fails that people do not live up to this mission this is their evangelism here to be a blessing to the nations and they will fail at doing that. In fact, they get very selfish. You know, and they turn and look like everyone else. So instead of being a blessing, they end up looking like the nations, yeah. which leads to problems later on. Which is um, maybe a warning for us nowadays. We right. shouldn't try to be like the culture because we can't help the culture if we're like the culture. Right, right. We are called oh. to point the culture to what they need. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's why the church is the vanguard. We are yeah. the, the, the ambassadors of a new creation, right? And how can you be an ambassador of a new creation if you end up just looking Looking. like the old creation? Yeah. Because um, they're not going to look to you as anything different. So right. so keep that thought in mind, too. And we should keep that thought when we get to weird passages like Corinthians and how the church practices and worship and stuff yeah. like that. It should be odd, different, yep. um, which is good. So good. So we get this idea of blessing. Jacob uh, blesses Pharaoh. And then finally, at the end, um, we have Jacob blesses you know the two sons of jo Joseph. And then finally, in chapter 49, is the concluding kind of climax of the book of Genesis, um, Jacob blesses the 12 tribes. And he kind of tells them, we're even told that this is what will happen to you in days to come. Um, so what are some of the blessings here that kind of stick out to you? What? Some of them are weird. But, okay. Um, I know, do, 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 do. there's one yeah, about there being by the, um, will be sea, by the sea or something, and I'm assuming that one Zebulun. is uh, Zebulun. Yep. This, they, they, he gets territory by the sea. Right, they're allowed at that territory. But yeah. what happens when you read the book of Josh, the book of Judges? Not the ones is they're that not they fail to yeah. drive them out. Um, yeah, so it's um, kind of like they are blessed to get this, but they do not get the blessing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, some of these are just kind of you know, some of these aren't that great. Good, like Simeon and Levi, let my soul come not into their council. Right. Um, for in their anger they killed men. Um, 
not so good. But then you get, I guess, the one we actually know exactly what it means, Judah. Right. Um, Judah. Um, do, 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 do. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. Right. So, of course, the line of Judah ends with, you know, we get Jesus. The scepter will not depart. Yeah. Um, it's that promise again of yeah. the Messiah. And this, each of these blessings will actually play out in the book of Joshua and Judges and Kings, actually. Um, so you'll see here Reuben. Uh, he's the firstborn, but because he's the firstborn, he's supposed to be preeminent, so he's supposed to have the blessing. But guess what, Reuben? Uh, you will not have it because you went up to your father's bed yep. and you slept around with my, one of my wives, and therefore you will not have that. So he'll become insignificant. And later on, they really just fade from view. As you read more of the Old Testament, you're like, what happened to Reuben? They didn't, don't, not even in the picture. They are. There's a lot um, of, yeah, because, well, you end up with Judah, Benjamin, and then the rest of them are kind of, damn, right. I think it's a little, it's, Yep. I always get them all screwed up. But. Simeon and Levi, yeah, like you said, because of killing the this, this city there with the raping of Dinah. Um, you know, don't let me come into their council. Uh, they will be, um, I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them. So the Levites, they get no towns, they get no inheritance, they are scattered. Um, so that comes true there. Uh, Simeon, I do believe, if I'm remembering correctly, they get put, uh, so Judah gets territory, and in the middle of Judah, oh, the Simeon. Ones. I should have grabbed um, the map. I know I should have grabbed my map too. <laughs> so Simeon gets put there, and what happens to them? They just kind of yeah. fade away. Um, so yeah, it happens to them. Judah, of course, we get this the, the scepter, the mm -hmm. ruling powers, Jesus. Uh, this is why Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah here, because Judah is a lion's cub. Um, you know, that will not overcome. There's the um, here an important passage that will be used in the prophets. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. An image of wine and milk becomes in the prophets key mm. things of the messianic era. That when the Messiah comes, there's going to be an abundance of wine, there's going to be an abundance of milk, um, of resources, and so things like, like that. The promised land is a land flowing with milk and honey. Yep. So this will become important for Jesus too. Uh, we talked about Zebulun there. Issachar is a strong donkey. Um, yeah, I have to look into more of that. Uh, kind of there. Yeah, some of these aren't as obvious as the other right, ones. As other ones, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Um, one of the most famous of judges is Samson. He's from the he's tribe of Jan, Dan. Dan. Mm -hmm. So he, Dan, will fulfill this blessing from Jacob. Um, and if you know just Samson's story, when we get there, he's all over the place, which is what he'll say. In yeah. fact, Dan will become associated with idolatry in the Old Testament, mm -hmm. and which is why he's kind of excluded in a lot of the blessings later on. Uh, Gad, uh, Raiders shall raid Gad, so he's kind of on the frontier, and you know, this is what's going to happen to them. Uh, Asher's food shall be rich, you know, so they have a good, a good supply of higher up people live in Asher. Um, you know, Naphtali is a doze let loose that bears beautiful, uh, that bears beautiful fawns, right? Probably good looking. So if you're from Naphtali, you're probably mm -hmm. a good looking person. Um, Joseph, fruitful. Um, the two sons of Joseph, of course, Manasseh and Ephraim become, um, Ephraim tribes. especially become the preeminent tribe. Um, so it's kind of cool in the book when Judah and Joseph meet because these are the two important tribes later on. And so it's kind of like here you get the, uh, the, the father figures meeting of these two tribes. It's kind of cool. Um, the God of your father will help you and all that good stuff. Um, you get the thing, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf in the morning devours a prey, at evening divides the spoil. So kind of warlord, warlike, um, things like that too. But there's a very curious interlude in the blessings. Verse 18, I want to read that, Phil, read that. I wait for your salvation, O Lord. Yeah, it's like Jacob is like blessing his sons and says, I wait for your salvation. And this is kind of, I actually think that the note says this, that Jacob here sees in his sons the salvation of the world. So the future, the salvation of the world is tied up in Jacob's lineage. And so through Jacob here is through noticing Israel. that. Yeah, so through Israel, the salvation will come to the world. Uh, so that's cool. So that's kind of that reiteration of the final blessing through Jesus. So good. And then... Boom. Just yeah. like that, we've reached, as I titled this, the end of the beginning. Um, we've kind of come from the creation of the world now to setting the scene for the book of Exodus. And as we march forward, of course, like we said, read also chapters, at, at book of Acts, chapters 1 through 3. We'll we won't cover, cover that, right that now. as a big chunk next. Because that's, we don't want to Don't want to break that, that up too much. Because uh, the book of Acts is important. Well, the first three chapters are, you get the ascension at Pentecost in there. So Right, we can talk a whole hour on that. Um, we have whole church days just devoted to right. those two stories we so. do yeah so just good important stuff so any final reflections that you can think of as we get to the end of genesis um, one book down 
uh, one kind of apologetic -y kind of thought, um, the, there's a lot of question about who the Pharaoh is, mm. um, who mm. Joseph was under. Oh, that's a good point. We really don't know. Um, Egyptian chronology is a little messed up. There's this like set idea of how Egyptian chronology is, but there, there's probably some, there's issues with the, what people think the chronology of Egypt is. Um, there's even, you know, biblical scholars who think this, and there's also non-biblical scholars who think this. So we really don't know. Uh, there's also the whole, there's no mention of the, which we can talk about this more when we get to Exodus, but there's no mention of the Israelites living in Egypt. But first, they probably weren't called that. And second of all, that was kind of an embarrassing episode for the Egyptians. So right. they probably didn't, you know, didn't get into history. A lot of things don't get into history, actually. Right. Um, so just keep that in mind, too. People often wonder who the Pharaoh is. And it's like, we really don't know. We can maybe kind of have an idea. I think that people have ideas where certain ones might fit it. Um, but there were also a lot of famines throughout the, you know, years, right. too. So it's hard to pinpoint which famine was this. And um, just kind of a interesting side thought. Don't get right. too hung up on that because... There's just so much we don't know and so much we can't so much, know. So much we don't know about history itself outside of the Bible that people think that this is all set in stone. And it's we like, we don't know. We don't... A lot of the pharaohs we know very little right. about besides maybe their name. Um, so, yeah. yeah, just as a kind of a side apologetics thought. And that's, you know, that's a good point, too, when we talk about history or archaeology and things like that, is that the only thing that we know about the past is what's been written, that's been passed down, uh, or things that we find that we then have to yeah. interpret what they even mean yeah. that we find. Um, so I heard one archaeologist say that we've probably discovered 1% of everything that there is to discover, and out of that 1% of things that we've discovered, probably there's 1% of the 1% that we, that we actually know what that means. Um, yeah. So, you know, because we find so much stuff, and you're just like, what is this? Hmm. Um, so that's probably a good, important thing, too. It kind of r r humbles us and makes us be like, oh, we're, we're not yeah. as smart as we think we are and have it all yeah. figured out. And so um, archaeology doesn't necessarily, it doesn't contradict, there's nothing been found that we disproves. know for sure that yeah. disproves the Bible. Right. You can't use archaeology to prove the Bible, but there's nothing that disproves it. Yeah. So just so keep that in mind when someone's like, you know, that, well, this disproves the Bible's chronology or whatever. And it's, history's a lot more complicated yeah. than that. Right. Archaeology is a helpful tool for many things, but it's not like the proof that, you yeah. know, so, ah, we proved it. it just, yeah. That's not how the scriptures work. No. Um, so. That's a good point. Anyway. So, Wonderful. Um, well. So, yeah. One book down, after, well, by the time you get to the end of this week, if you're reading it day by day, um, you'll have one book down. So, yeah. out of the 66, this is one of the longer ones, too. So. It is. It is. Um, I think Isaiah is the only other one that's super long like this. Yeah, you know, it's the longest book is Jeremiah. Oh, he's the longest of the prophets. Psalms okay. is the longest book. Yeah. But, um, Isaiah and Jeremiah are long, but yeah, yeah, Genesis is one of the longer ones, so. It's good. So yeah, good. fantastic. And well, how about we conclude then? We talk about blessings. Let's give all of you a blessing as well. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you guys next week. We'll try some around this time uh, to do these videos and kind of go through and, and hit, hit some of the points in the text and just kind of discuss it because I love doing this kind of stuff. So, cool. And if you have questions, don't forget to let us know. Or observations, too. We like observations. Yeah, that was so. fun. Okay. All right, we'll take care of Christ Lutheran. We'll see you soon, and uh, have a good one.